This video is sponsored by Misplay. More about them later. I did a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Soul Silver, but all of my encounters and every enemy trainer was completely randomized, meaning that anyone could have any Pokemon. Who knows what youngster Joey is packing in a randomizer? It could be his standard malnourished Rattata, or it could be the Demon of the Underworld. Of course, randomizers can work the other way too. Gym leaders could be gifted literal gods, or they could get the short end of the stick and be stuck with a team of magic carps. Or worse. So, in order to avoid an anticlimactic showdown against Red and a randomized team of toddlers, I teamed up with my fellow Nuzlocker, Antler Boy, to add a twist to this challenge. Instead of leaving everything up to the fickle hands of fate, Antler Boy meticulously designed the teams of every Johto gym leader and member of the Elite Four. I had no idea what to expect, and potential disaster was waiting around every corner, because in a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints in battle, it's dead forever. And since I can only catch one randomized Pokemon per route, every encounter matters. The rest of the rules for this playthrough are shown here and in the description down below. Oh, and I made a ROM hack for Antler Boy too, so be sure to check out that video on his channel as well. But after this one, you're actually legally required to fully watch any YouTube video you click on. In addition to the major boss fights, Antler Boy has also rigged my selection of starters to represent three indelible pillars of the Flygon HG community. Trap Inch for my channel mascot, Sveal for the fan favorite Sveal Team 6 video, and Magnemity for my consistent bastardization of the English language. While she may not be the best choice, I can't not choose Drapinch as my starter, lest I let that Sinoian scumbag Garchomp FJ win the Dragon Ground type war. So, with Charlotte on board, our randomized journey begins. After chomping through my rival's spiel and cooperating with Johto's boys in blue, I start lobbing balls at anything and everything I can find. Marcello, Patty, Scotty, Jimmy, Leanne, and Bernice are all caught with just a single ball, but that's why they call me Dr. One Ball HG. After some leveling up, everyone except Leanne prepares to go to war against Faulkner, aka Antler Boy's first customized trial. This battle will really set the tone for what we can expect going forward. The apparently god that is Faulkner leads with an Apom, and I lead with Charlotte the Trap Inch. The Hansy Monkey starts off with a tickle to lower my attack and defense, which might have been a bigger deal had we not immediately followed it up with a critical hit bite for a clean one-shot. So that brings in Faulkner's second and final Pokemon, Smeargle, a pretty generous ace given Smeargle's abysmal attack and special attack. But if I had to guess, this thing is probably loaded with technician-boosted coverage moves, so I switch to Scotty, my own Smeargle, for a literal dogfight. Somewhere PETA weeps. A Vine Whip on the switch, followed by a Water Gun on the following turn, confirms my suspicions, though as you can see, even a critical hit is barely doing any damage. Scotty eventually connects with a Hypnosis, granting me a semi-safe switch into Bernice the Beedrill. Then it just takes two three-hit Fury attacks to knock out the Narcoleptic Artiste and win us the very first gym badge of the challenge. There's three encounters before Bugsy, and ironically, they're all bug types. The most notable, of course, is Queen Basalt herself. Since we're playing a randomizer, the nickname theme is randomly generated names. I know, I'm, I'm very creative. Brilliant ideas just come to me. But Queen Basalt trumps any nickname theme, no matter how unique and earth-shatteringly revolutionary it is. She's also an obvious addition to the team as we go to face off against the God of Short Shorts. Bugsy Scyther has been changed into a Farfetch'd, a downgrade for sure, but one that does remarkably well against my entire team. I switch to Patty the Poliwag, who eats a Leer and then completely whiffs a Hypnosis. As a result, Farfetch nails her with a massive critical hit U-turn that just barely doesn't one-shot. Bugsy reveals his second Pokemon to be Cubone, so I go out to Jimmy the Turtwig on a soft headbutt. A single critical hit Razor Leaf takes out the Orphan and Farfetch'd comes back in. I go to Marcelo the Pidgey on another Leer, and then it's time to start doing some damage. Sadly, Gust isn't much to brag about, and now that we're at minus two defense from another Leer, we gotta get out of here. The next several turns are a whole lot of switching and hoping that Farfetch doesn't get a poorly timed critical hit. Eventually, the Waterfowl U turns out into her fellow flyer Delibird, who doesn't seem to have anything other than fake out and present. So Bernice just takes care of her with a handful of Fury attacks. That brings Farfetch back out for a third time 
time, but since she's already pretty low on HP from our last outing against my team, Marcelo is able to switch back in and save the day with two quick attacks, winning us the battle completely deathless. Next up is some more encounters as we make our way to Goldenrod City. My Ilex Forest encounter is a Venonat, so let's just see what his randomly generated nickname is. Maybe we re-roll that one. Drew is much better. We swoop up a handful of other encounters here as well, most of which are quite good, if not only for being able to evolve before the next gym leader's level cap. The mysterious egg that Professor Elm gave me also hatches into a gloom. Quite mysterious indeed. Funny enough, Kay still knows Togepi's egg move Extra Sensory, which makes her the perfect random lead into the third gym leader Whitney. She leads with a Quillfish that immediately sets up a layer of spikes, but then gets popped by a single Extra Sensory. Sunflora comes out second and would normally be an easy target for Acid, but Kay is holding a Choice Specs which locks her into Extra Sensory. Oh by the way, Overworld items have been randomized as well, so that's why I have a Choice Specs. Now fortunately, Sunflora appears to be an ingrained Leech Seed stall set, which is completely useless against my Grass Poison type, so a few turns of spamming Choice Specs boosted Extra Sensories, and the battle is won. That means we've made it to Akrotech City, unlocking a huge chunk of the remaining routes in Johto. A quick catching montage introduces 9 new faces to my ever-growing roster, and with the new level cap of 25, it's not too long before it's time to face off against Morty for badge number 4. He leads with Pseudo Wudo as I lead with my new powerhouse, Jessie the Cadabra. She's traded her Twisted Spoon for a pair of Choice Specs, meaning that a Psybeam is more than enough to one-shot Morty's fake tree. That's what you get for lying, you immoral turd. Kecleon is second, so not wanting to get nailed by a faint attack, I switch to Tanya for a literal chameleon fight. Somewhere PETA weeps. We get hit with a fake out and then start trading off attacks. I decide to bring in Jimmy to finish the job, though missing out on the KO with Razor Leaf means that Morty heals with a Hyper Potion. But a lucky flinch from Headbutt means that we can take the KO without losing any more HP. So third for Morty is Snorlax. Well, that just got significantly harder. I have exactly zero answers into this Snorlax, which after a few turns, I discover has a moveset of Yawn, Headbutt, Rest, and Recycle. He's also holding a Chesto Berry, which means that he can consistently get all the way back to full HP over and over and over again, without a single immunity or resistance to normal type attacks, or a way to quickly take out this massive tank of a Pokemon, I'm completely screwed. Yawn means that I can't reliably set up, and I'm forced to switch out every few turns lest I fall asleep. Switching gives Snorlax the opportunity to nail one of my Pokemon with a headbutt, or just get back to full HP with Recycle and Rest. I start by hitting him with a few growls from Manuela the Flaffy. Barring critical hits, this will at least lower his damage output. Since Manuela also paralyzed Snorlax via static, I go to Jimmy and start firing off headbutts in the hopes of getting lucky with some paraflinch hacks but it doesn't work and Snorlax hits us with a yawn. So it's off to Sylvia the Murkrow who takes 33 damage from a minus two headbutt. We can do a bit of damage with two wing attacks thanks to a full paralysis, but then Snorlax goes for rest, getting back to full HP. Two more wing attacks deal decent damage as Snorlax uses Recycle to get back his Chesto Berry and then goes for a headbutt to bring Sylvia down to three HP. So let's try K. She survives two headbutts and at the very least can burn Snorlax's Chesto Berry with a sleep powder, ensuring that his next rest will keep him asleep for two full turns. So I switch to Jesse on another nasty headbutt. But despite dropping into the yellow, it does just shy of 50%. And after firing off a Choice Spec Psybeam, it looks like another one will be enough to knock out Snorlax. So as long as Snorlax doesn't crit Jesse, we're in the clear. But obviously he does. Well that sucks, Jimmy comes in and a Razor Leaf tragically misses out on getting the KO, which allows Snorlax to freely rest up the full HP. But without his Chesto Berry, he's asleep for two turns and I can comfortably go for a curse to boost my attack and defense. This does mean that Snorlax now outspeeds us, but Razor Leaf is doing enough for what appears to be maybe a three hit kill. Since Snorlax wastes a turn going for Recycle, things are looking promising. He's forced to rest on the next turn as another Razor Leaf connects. He then goes for Recycle as Razor Leaf brings him back into the yellow. With a little bit of luck, I think Jimmy can actually pull this off. 
Snorlax goes for rest, so I take the opportunity to set up a second curse. On the following turn, he uses Recycle to let me fire off a Razor Leaf for almost 50%. Then he goes for a Headbutt, which crits again and also flinches. So that about does it. I don't really see how I get out of this one. I mean, I actually do manage to defeat Snorlax, but not before losing Kay and Tanya. Sylvia can come in and finish off Snorlax with one last wing attack, but Morty has one more Pokemon, which is Psyduck. I switch to Manuela, who's hit by a water pulse that gets another critical hit, so she can't wake up fast enough and falls two turns later. I bring Sylvia back in to hit the Psyduck with a wing attack, but it's not enough for a one-shot, so she falls to another water pulse. Last is Jimmy at 1 HP, but he gets outsped, and just like that, I've wiped, and the run is over. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Terrible RNG aside, that Snorlax set was, uh something else, but there's not much to do except try again. I see a lot of sentiment in the Nuzlocke community about people struggling to find the motivation to restart a run after a brutal wipe. My best advice is to just take a break from the challenge and wait until you've fully mentally recovered from the loss. And a great way to take a short break is with the sponsor of this video, Mistplay. Mistplay is a leading loyalty app for those who love to play mobile games, offering a vast catalog of games from every different genre. By playing games through Mistplay, you can earn points towards redeeming gift cards from various vendors, like Amazon and the Google Play Store. It's a nice way to relax and unwind when you're bored and earn some rewards as you go. I played a handful of games with Mistplay, many of which are actually pretty entertaining and a good mental break. It only took me a few days of playing in my downtime to earn my first reward. Full disclosure, you're not going to be breaking the bank with Misplay, but I found it to be the perfect time killer for when you just want to turn your brain off and play some mobile games. We've all sat in the bathroom staring at our phone until our legs go numb, so instead of doom scrolling or seeing the same four Pokemon memes over and over and over again, you might as well be earning some rewards with Misplay. And maybe you'll even discover your new favorite mobile game. To get started, you can click the link in the video description and make sure to use my code inside the app to get 30 free points which will get you on your way to redeeming your very first gift card. Full details are down below. Thanks so much to Misplay for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into attempt number two. Since we only randomized a single seed, many of my encounters are the same as in attempt one, though there are a few notable differences. This time, I made sure to fully exhaust my available encounters, which included making the trek to Route 43 north of Mahogany Town, where I found a Bastiodon named Della. A handful of stone evolutions means that by the time I get back to Morty, which is relatively easy to do once you know what to expect, my team is significantly stronger and ready to obliterate that stupid chubby Snorlax. With a thirst for vengeance, I stare down my nemesis and prepare to unleash a fury hitherto unknown to mankind. Morty's lead Sudowoodo is drowned by a single surf from Leandro, ignore the spelling mistake, the Ludicolo. Snorlax comes out second this time, so I nail him with a surf for some solid damage before getting hit by a yawn. Della comes in to shrug off a headbutt and then nail him with a taunt. Metal sounds lower Snorlax's special defense as he tickles my rock steel type with quad resisted headbutts. After a few turns, Leandro comes back in on a yawn and takes the kill with a second surf. Good riddance, you glutton sycophant. With our team not completely shattered by Snorlax, it's relatively trivial to take care of Morty's remaining two Pokemon. Rufus the Magnemity takes them both out with Thunderbolts, and victory is finally ours. The fourth gym badge means that we can use Surf outside of battle, letting us catch a few more Pokemon on the way to Cyanwood City. The next gym leader is Chuck, notoriously a moron in standard playthroughs of Heart Gold and Soul Silver. But if I learned anything from the Snorlax Massacre of 23, it's that I need to be ready for anything. He leads with Lopunny, and I lead with Leandro the Ludicolo. He's a pretty reliable lead since Surf Spam hits hard, and his unique typing gives him a solid matchup into most Pokemon. Case in point, Low Punny falls to two surfs without doing any damage to my happy-go-lucky pineapple. Chuck sends out his second and final Pokemon, Lucario, indicating a pretty, uh, interesting theme for his team. 
Force Palm hits hard, but then Surf hits harder. Not wanting to risk a crit though, I switch to Lessy, which I'm only now realizing may also be a typo. Is Lessy actually a name, or did I mean to name her Leslie? The world may never know. But anyways, Lessy comes in on a bone club, indicating that despite the randomization, Chuck remains dumber than a sack of brain dead bricks. Unfortunately, Lessy doesn't have much in the way of solid damage against Lucario, so I switch to Felton on another bone club. A third bone club nearly pays off for old Chucky, since five full hits bring Felton down to just 12 HP, but then we take the KO with a Karate Chop, barely winning us the battle completely deathless. Next up is a whole slew of encounters as we explore the western expansion of Johto. A Torkoal without Drought, an Arbok with Intimidate, and a Held Choice Scarf for some reason, an Apom, a Lyleep, and last but not least, a Feebas. Well, actually, definitely last, it's it's a Feebas. I also find a sickly Rattata, so I do the humane thing and put her out of her misery. After Lance does some casual homicide, I can get one final Pokemon from the Rocket Hideout. These electrodes have all been randomized, so there's no telling what we might get. Ah. I mean, Surskit's not terrible, right? At least Masquerain has Intimidate, and there's no guarantee that any of the other electrodes would have been any better anyways. <laughs> well, next up is Price, whose level cap is lower than Jasmine's because Johto is a hot mess. My squad's starting to look pretty strong, and it's a good thing too because Price has got himself a Sun team. Thankfully, Torkoal doesn't have Drought in this generation, so Leandro just sends him swimming with the fishes. Venusaur is second, and fearing a sludge bomb, I switch to Rufus, though it ends up just being a sleep powder. Great. Well, I go back to Leandro as Venusaur sets up a sunny day. He then outspeeds and nails us with a massive solar beam before we're able to retaliate with a massiver ice beam. Unfortunately, it's not quite enough for the KO, and I'm unsure if Price will heal, so I switch to Dominic the Arabok. Price does indeed heal, which is a bummer, but at the very least we outspeed to nail him with a glare before getting put to sleep by another sleep powder. I stay in for a few turns until Dominic wakes up and nails Venusaur with a few crunches. After getting put to sleep again, I switch to Rufus as Venusaur uses Synthesis. Great. Well, from here, Rufus eventually wakes up and starts hitting Venusaur with charge beams. A handful of lucky full paralyses means that we manage to stay awake and at full HP as Venusaur falls a few turns later. Last is Infernape, so I switch to Dominic, expecting the snake to be a sad but necessary sack. But his Intimidate is enough to let him barely tank a sun-boosted flame wheel. Pretty impressive, so as a reward, I switch him out to Brooks the Seedra on a Mach Punch. Then, Infernape sets up Sunny Day, meaning that our Surf isn't enough for the one-shot. On the following turn, the Speedy Ape gives me a heart attack by having a Thunder Punch tech, but without the crit, Brooks survives, and one last Surf means that we've won Gym Badge number 6. I can't really say that things are going all that well. I am getting by Deathless, but just barely. I'm making risky plays, and eventually I'm gonna be punished for it. My team is pretty imbalanced, and they don't cover each other's weaknesses particularly well. But as I head into the fight against Jasmine, I'm not making any changes. Because change is scary. And besides, I mean, it's just Jasmine. What could possibly go wrong? She leads with Floatzel, and I lead with Leandro. See, this is fine. Floatzel sets up Rain Dance before we strike back with an Absorb. Admittedly, it's not the strongest Grass-type move in the world, in fact, it's actually the weakest, but the recovery is nice as Floatzel starts going for Crunch. It also gets Jasmine to waste a Hyper Potion. A few turns later, Floatzel falls, and Leandro remains at nearly full HP. Rain Dish helps a ton as well. Gyarados comes in second, so I switch to Rufus on a Dragon Rage. This obviously does 40 damage, which is exactly 50% of Rufus's HP. A second one will get the kill, but a quick calc reveals that with the level advantage, Rufus will be able to outspeed. Unless Gyarados has a plus speed nature. Well, damn. Steel types are pretty incredible for randomizers, so this is a rough loss, in addition to being pretty embarrassing. 
Never feels great losing an electric type to a water flying type. Roger comes in and almost dies to an ice fang, which would have been even more embarrassing, but since he's a tanky boy, we live to connect with a leech seed. Then I switch to Dominic, whose intimidate is meaningless since Gyarados just crits with an ice fang anyways, but at least we can get some good damage off with Crunch as Gyarados sets up Rain Dance. With the help of Leech Seed Chip, another Crunch is enough to get the KO and bring in Jasmine's final Pokemon, Ludicolo. Gotta admire a woman with taste. I switch to Leandro on a soft water pulse for a literal pineapple fight. Somewhere Peta weeps. But since Jasmine's Ludi has Giga Drain, we're a bit outmatched. Unfortunately, it's also at this point that my recording cuts out. I wanted to go back and watch the footage to see how much damage Giga Drain was doing to see if Leandro can stay in for another turn here. He can't, but after I paused the recording to rewatch the footage, I forgot to restart the recording, and so I missed the last few turns of the battle where Dominic comes back in to finish off Ludicolo. Sorry folks. I wanted to find a video of a big snake eating a pineapple as replacement footage, but the only thing I could find was a YouTube video from 13 years ago called Snake Exploding a Pineapple. I thought that it might be a video of a snake coiling itself around a pineapple until it pops, but it's actually just a video with a man, presumably named Snake, blowing up a pineapple with fireworks. YouTube is a beautiful platform. Anyways, a few unremarkable fights against my rival and various members of Team Rocket, along with some largely disappointing encounters, is all that stands between us and a showdown against the final gym leader, Claire. After the tragedy of losing Rufus, I've revamped my team to hopefully have some better type coverage. Claire leads with Jirachi, and I lead with Herschel the Drapion that I picked up as a Skoruppy all the way back in Slowpoke Well. Jirachi doesn't seem to have much in the way of dealing damage to Herschel, as they just repeatedly go for Wish and Protect. This gives me the opportunity to set up two layers of Toxic Spikes and then spam Acupressure for random boosts. Eventually, it's revealed that Claire's Mythical does have Doom Desire, but in Generation 4, it still has 85% accuracy, which is basically nothing after a few evasion boosts from Acupressure. We also gain a few special defense boosts as well, which means that even when it does hit, it barely makes a dent in my now absurdly boosted Battle Armor Drapion. Needless to say, Herschel sweeps Claire's entire team. We are stuck with using Bite, since Herschel's Generation 4 moveset is pretty lousy, but it gets the job done against Claire's Psychic-type team. Actually, we do have a pretty scary moment against her final Pokémon Bronzong, who goes for Gyro Ball. Since Herschel's at plus 6 speed from Accupressure, had Bronzong connected with that Gyro Ball, it might have been enough for the KO, even through the defense boosts. Nevertheless, we go unpunished, and the 8th gym badge is ours. That means that it's off to the Pokemon League, but not before visiting the Kimono Girls and clicking Surf to one-shot every single one of their Pokemon, except for the second Lopunny. She goes down to a second Surf from Leandro. Surf Spam, who to thunk? We also gotta head deep into the Whirl Islands to confront the mysterious legendary beast of the sea. It looks like a Lugia. It sounds like a Lugia. It tastes like a Lugia. But it's an Azelf. Welcome to the team, Laura. A few more mediocre encounters later and we've made it to the Indigo Plateau. Here's my final team, all leveled up to the level cap of 47 to match Karen's ace. This team is a nice blend of bulky tanks and speedy sweepers. We've got a lot of immunities and at least one Pokemon resists every type in the game. So let's see if they've got what it takes to become champions of the Pokemon League. First up is Server Will, who comes out hot with a Hail team. Honestly, Ice types? One of our weaker matchups. I set up a layer of Toxic Spikes with Herschel before getting hit by a nasty Blizzard. Della comes in next, but the Hail chip is less than ideal here, as is the massive Wood Hammer we have to tank before getting off a Toxic. Right away, this is going very poorly. I switch to Laura on an Avalanche that thankfully only does a little bit of damage. Then I can take the KO with a Flamethrower. Weavile comes in second, so a second Flamethrower takes her out as well. That brings in Frostlass, which with Snow Cloak and probably a held Bright Powder, is really not what I want to see. But my team is just thoroughly unprepared for this matchup, so I kinda have to go for the Hail Mary. No pun intended. Thankfully, we connect with a Flamethrower and Frostlass falls. 
Fourth is Wall Rain, so I switch to Leandro on a pretty nasty Blizzard. A Mega Drain gives me back enough HP to barely survive a second Blizzard, which thankfully doesn't freeze or crit. Nor does the third Blizzard that goes into Brooks as we switch out. An over the top choice specs Draco Meteor picks off Wall Rain, which leaves Will with his final Pokemon, Mamoswine. Shame I didn't lock myself into Surf, huh? Well, begging that Mamoswine goes for Earthquake here, I switch to Laura, who has Levitate. It's not an Earthquake, but Stealth Rock is fine too, because now we can take the kill with a Flamethrower, winning us a very scary battle. Before continuing, let's discuss that a bit, because that battle could have been an absolute disaster had one of Will's Blizzards landed a Freeze or a Crit. Weather is one of the most common ways to make enemy trainers difficult, so I absolutely should have anticipated a hail team in the Elite Four. One of the easiest ways to counter weather teams is with a weather setter of your own. Unfortunately, I don't have one, nor do I have any of the TMs for Sunny Day, Rain Dance, Hail, or Sandstorm, since they've all been randomized. As a result, this fight was always going to be pretty difficult, but I definitely could have done a better job at building my team to have an answer to Blizzard spam. I think it's important to step back and learn from battles like this, even if the end result was a deathless victory. I got lucky, and that won't happen forever. If you don't learn from your mistakes and tighten up your play, it will eventually catch up to you. Anyways, the second member of the Elite Four is Koga, who leads with... a Celebi. Well, if it's anything like the last mythical we faced, this'll be an easy setup for Herschel. And with Celebi going for Trick, it looks like it will be. I'm not sure why Trick is failing, we're holding an item and presumably so is Celebi. Like if I had to guess, it's probably a choice scarf. So I'm not really sure what's going on here. Maybe Trick just doesn't work the way it's supposed to in Gen 4? I don't know. Feel free to explain it in the comments down below if you know what's happening. Anyways, after setting up two layers of Toxic Spikes and getting to plus six attack with Swords Dance, a Poison Fang gets a clean kill on Celebi. That brings in Regirock, so let's pause. Gun to your head, if you had one guess as to what Regirock is gonna do here, what would it be? If you guessed Explosion, congratulations, you are not an idiot. I, however, am an idiot, because instead of making the super obvious and safe switch into Della the Bastiodon, I miss out on the kill with Bite, and then Regirock explodes, instantly killing Herschel. In a very, very, very tiny defense of what just happened, Explosion is actually an unfavorable role to kill Herschel here. I mean, granted, Regirock could very well just have a choice band or something, and anyone could have seen that explosion coming from a mile away, but I, I don't know. This definitely is not the dumbest way I've lost a Pokemon. I mean, actually, it's not even the dumbest way I've lost a Drapion. But anyways, as Koga brings in Shedinja third, it's clear that this team is filled with trolls. I use Protect so that Shedinja just falls to the poison damage from Toxic Spikes. Togekiss is fourth and reveals that his gimmick is Metronome. We eat a soft Shadow Sneak before hitting him with a Toxic, though Della's massive quad weaknesses make rolling the dice with Metronome pretty scary. As if to confirm my fear, Togekiss rolls Mud Bomb into our Protect. Metronome number 3 rolls Psycho Cut, which lets us safely get off a taunt. And since Metronome is technically a status move, Togekiss is forced to struggle, letting us take the KO with a combination of Recoil, Ancient Power, and Poison Damage. All that's left is Mew, who probably knows Transform, so I stay in, Mew does indeed Transform, and then I hit them with a taunt. Pretty funny to see Bastiodon take poison damage here, but since Mew is now forced to use exclusively Ancient Power, I can comfortably switch to Roger and take the KO with a quad effective Earthquake, winning us the battle. That was very silly. I cannot believe I lost a Pokemon there. Bruno is next and kicks things off with a Machamp. That makes our new lead of Laura a perfect start since Psychic is enough for a clean one-shot. Blastoise comes in second and takes a massive chunk of damage from Thunderbolt before using Fling for a bit of damage and a burn. Okay, well, Bruno heals on the next turn, so I take the opportunity to set up a nasty plot, and then after that, a Thunderbolt is a clean kill. Third is Lanoon, and I'm worried about extreme speed, so I switch to Della, but it's just Fling again. Okay, this is another troll team. After poisoning Lanoon with Toxic and doing some light damage for a few turns, I switch to Brooks. Lanoon falls and Alakazam comes out. He flings a Twisted Spoon and then goes down to a Surf. Slacking is last, so I go back to Della, who tanks a fling powered off of Iron Ball. That would have actually done a lot of damage into Brooks. A few turns later, Slacking falls and victory is ours. 
So the final member of the Elite Four is Karen, and since she leads with Vaporeon, it looks like we're facing off against an Evolutions team. Vaporeon goes for Protect, which lets me get off a nasty plot for free. On the next turn, a Thunderbolt gets the clean KO. This is gonna get really ugly for Karen's Evolutions, especially because it seems like the only one she doesn't have is the Dark-type Umbreon. Flamethrowers kill Leafeon and Glaceon, Psychic kills Jolteon who just uses Magnet Rise, and then Flamethrower kills Espeon, winning us the easiest battle so far. Well, except for the battle against Bruno, but we don't talk about Bruno. Just like that, we're ready to face off against the champion of the Indigo Plateau. If I had to guess, he'll have some pretty tough threats, and with just five Pokemon on my team, things can still get pretty ugly. Schoolgirl Lance leads with... Tyranitar. If I was paying any attention, I should have seen that coming. It makes my lead of Laura pretty terrible and their held focus sash completely useless. I immediately switch to Roger as Titar goes for a pretty nasty crunch. Then I set up a Leech Seed hoping to get back a bit of HP as Tyranitar sets up Stealth Rock. In hindsight, that was pretty dumb since on the next turn, Earthquake is enough for a clean one shot. I really haven't been on my A game for this entire playthrough, huh? Glysaur is second and almost certainly has Ice Fang, so I switch out to Brooks on a Toxic. Okay, well regardless, we can take the kill with Surf after Glysaur stalls for a turn with Protect. By the time the Fly Scorpion falls, Brooks is already quite low on HP. Lance's third Pokemon is Flygon, which ironically is quite good against my entire team. Since Brooks is locked into Choice Spec Surf and would get outsped anyways, I swap into Della, hoping to resist a Dragon-type move, but Flygon goes for Earthquake and gets a devastating one-hit kill. Yikes. I bring in Leandro, who after Stealth Rock damage, tanks a massive Draco Meteor with just 19 HP. That's all we need to fire off an Ice Beam, but my heart drops as a Yachi Berry activates, meaning that Flygon survives and Leandro is most certainly dead. You have got to be kidding me. Leandro clutches up with an incredibly well-timed freeze. For all the times I've been screwed over by freeze, it is hilarious that I'm saved by a freeze into my very own mascot. You really cannot make this up. With Flygon Frozen, Leandro is able to take him out on the next turn with another Ice Beam, and after the mid-battle level up, survive the Sandstorm Chip with just 4 HP. That brings in Torterra 4th, who's primed to go down to another Ice Beam from Leandro, though this time it comes with a deadly price. Torterra does indeed fall, but as the Sandstorm continues to rage, so too does sweet, beautiful Leandro. An invaluable member throughout the playthrough and the life of any party, his infectious spirit can get the scroogiest of scrooges out on the dance floor, and he will be sorely missed. Alexa, play Livin' La Vida Loca by Antonio Banderas and Eddie Murphy. It was Leandro's favorite song. Uno, dos, cuatro, hit it! As Roger takes the stage, I'm happy to see Lance bring in Agron. With a quad effective earthquake, he goes down in one fell swoop, leaving Lance with his very last Pokemon, Swampert. That's just about perfect, isn't it? Because with one last Razor Leaf, we- All right, well that sucked, but let's just take him out with a Choice Specs boosted Draco Meteor instead. So, uh, Pokemon is kind of a stupid game, huh? Well, Roger comes back in and manages to finally connect with a 95% accurate Razor Leaf, which obviously cleanly kills Swampert, winning us the battle against Lance, and crowning my only two surviving team members, champions of the Indigo Plateau. But as we all know, this isn't the end, because the Kanto region and Trainer Red still await. Now, Antler Boy and I agreed that we didn't want to have to design eight more teams for the gym leaders of Kanto, and as a result, they're all pretty underwhelming. I also decided that for the sake of challenge, I wouldn't catch any new Pokemon in Kanto, so we can pretty easily just skip straight to the final fight against Trainer Red on Mount Silver. 
Roger and Laura remain on the squad, but the fallen members of the team have been replaced with Emery the Skuntank, Lessie the Salamence, Belton the Machamp, and Rich the Dugon. Can this team come together to defeat Antler Boy's final challenge, or will we come up short and lose the run in the 11th hour? Now's the time to find out. If I had to guess, Biker Red's lead will probably be Antler Boy's favorite Pokemon, Dunsparce, which would have made Felton the Machamp a perfect lead. But instead of going with my gut, I go with Ol Reliable. They kick things off with a Psychic that lands a critical hit for a clean one-hit KO. Pretty rude, Laura. Antler Boy, if you're watching, I'm so sorry for doing this to your favorite Pokemon, but maybe get a favorite Pokemon that can't be easily one-shot, you know? Anyways, Salamence comes out next, and fearing a Dragon Dance, I stay in to hit another Psychic for about 75%. It ends up being a far more predictable crunch, but since Laura is holding a Focus Sash, we're perfectly safe here. Another Psychic gets the KO, and our lead grows. Third is Charizard, so expecting a Fire-type move, I switch to Rich, the Thick Fat Dugon, but Charizard just goes for a massive Air Slash. On the next turn, he connects with another that causes a flinch, so... Uh... Thank you for your service, Rich. It was the performance of a lifetime, I, I guess. I bring in Lessie next, who has a wide lens to ensure that her Thunderfang always connects. It's not enough for the KO, but neither is the Dragon Pulse that comes out in retaliation. With another Thunderfang, Charizard falls, and Red is left with just the back half of his team. Nidoking is fourth, so I switch to Emery on an Ice Beam, which crits. We hit Nidoking with a Night Slash as a second Ice Beam leaves us with just 23 HP and a Freeze. The new guys are really getting put through the ringer, huh? Well, with Emery down, we can get a free switch back into Laura, who takes their third KO of the match with another Psychic. Fifth, then, is a Rattata at level one. Okay, so we're dealing with Fear Strats, or at least we should be if the AI didn't completely shit the bed. Since Rattata just goes for a quick attack instead of Endeavor, Flamethrower brings him down to his Focus Sash, and then hilariously, Red uses a full restore, so... yikes. Shaman is Red's final Pokémon, and we just outspeed to hit a super effective Flamethrower. But it's not even close to a one-shot, so with an Energy Ball, they take the kill on the Queen of the Late Game. Rest in peace, my sweet child. Felton comes in to replace Laura, and even with a choice scarf, he's not fast enough to outspeed Shaman, who fires off another nasty energy ball. I hold my breath as Felton's HP slowly ticks down, but it stops still well within the green. So with one final no-guard dynamic punch straight to the face, Shaman falls, winning us not just the battle against Biker Red, but the entire run. That was a really nice change of pace from some of my previous playthroughs. I want to give a huge shout out to Antler Boy for coming up with the twist of this video. And of course, now that the video is over, you are legally allowed to go check out his video, linked in the description down below. But before you do, I want to thank you for watching this video, and if you're a returning viewer, for your continued support. If you enjoyed this concept, let me know in the comments down below. It'd also be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future ROM hack challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. We're also doing a lot of other fun one-off videos on that channel, so be sure to check it out because my editors are doing a phenomenal job with the channel. And lastly, please consider subscribing to my Patreon or becoming a channel member on YouTube, which are the best ways to directly support this channel. The links to everything are in the description down below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.